Hey everybody, this video is uh, going to take you through some of the new features of Appleseed for Blender or Blender Seed as uh, affectionately call it. Uh, this will be for the 0 0.8.0 beta that is meant to go with Appleseed 1.9. Um, if they're not already out by the time this video goes up, but it should be up pretty shortly. And uh, like I said, this is basically just going to take you through some of the new features that were introduced with the latest release of uh, specifically like the OSL shading, uh, some of the render passes or AOVs, um, animation exports, stuff like that. And so it's it's not a fancy video. You won't see any fancy graphics or flashing lights or anything like that. But just uh, hopefully it'll be enough to show you how um, how everything works in this. So uh, uh, my name is John and I'm actually one of the programmers for Blender Seed. And so I guess if, uh, you know, you see something in here you don't like, like you don't like the feature, I'm probably the person you can blame for it. Uh, we've got a forum, we've got a discourse uh, chat channel, all kinds of ways you can give feedback on uh, what you do or don't like about this new workflow. So with that, let's jump right into it. So this is assuming that you have Appleseed and Blender Seed both installed on your computer. Uh, that's not really, uh, I'm not really going to go through that right now. I'm just kind of, a, kind of assuming that you've already done that. So we'll start up Blender. Once you're in here, you want to make sure that you have the Appleseed enabled, which I do. And you want to make sure that you have the path to the bin, which contains the Appleseed executable. You want to make sure you have that in here. Otherwise, uh, rendering won't work. OSL won't work. Basically, nothing will work. So anyway, you want to make sure that is in there. And then we switch over to Appleseed. And we'll just kind of get rid of the cube because, you know, that's that's boring. So... We'll add in a nice little monkey way over there where she shouldn't be. So we'll just quick do this. There we go. Now she's where she's supposed to be. So we got our nice little Suzanne here. And let's assign some materials to Suzanne. So we go over to the material tab. And here's the first thing you'll see. You'll see that uh, there's this little thing down here. Well, what's this for? Well actually ties in with the OSL system. So this system right here is going to look pretty familiar to anybody that's used Appleseed in the past. Um, it's the built-in material system, or I guess I, I kind of call it BIS. I don't know if that's an official acronym that Appleseed supports or not, but it, it's what I call it, so we'll stick with it. Um, this is the old system that basically has a number of hard-coded shaders in it. And this system's been around in Blender Seed for a while. Um, you'll notice it's a little bit simpler. It's been simplified and stripped back greatly because uh, what we're trying to do is we're actually trying to focus more on OSL shading. And so to do that, you actually have to basically tell the material that you want to use OSL shading instead of the BIS shading. And the way to do that is to click this little add Appleseed material node. When you do that, you'll see this gets filled in and all of the internal controls disappear. And the reason for that is that the shader is now completely using the OSL shading system. And so you don't need to see any of those controls down there anymore. So now to use OSL, we go over to the node editor. And then we click on the material. And here's the big catch. You actually have to manually click and bring up the material tree that is assigned to the material. I'm not exactly sure why that is. I think it's a limitation in Blender. At some point we might find a way around that, but right now this is kind of a, an extra step you have to make sure that you take. So um, once again, just make sure that you pick the appropriate material from the dropdown. And you always want to start off by clicking Shift A and you want to add an OSL surface. This is kind of the end node. Everything that you have upstream needs to feed into one of these. This is kind of like your material node from Cycles. So we create one of those and put it there. Now let's just do something simple. Let's add, let's add a shader. We'll add the Disney material. And so you see it pops up, we connect it together, and boom, you can see over here that our preview changed. And so now we've got our OSL material. And basically that's that's all we need. We can roll with this if we wanted to. We can change the colors. You know, you see a change here and the Disney materials will uh, update. So let's say we want to add a couple of textures to this. You know, maybe give it a little bit more variation than it already has. You can do that with a texture node. Add that and we'll just use uh, kind of a generic color texture here. There we go. And let's uh, let's just do our good old uh, 
physically based rendering workflow. So yeah, the color, we've got the metalness. Now here's the catch on the metalness. You'll notice that uh, the input for metalness is actually a gray, gray socket. And that matters. That means that the metalness actually takes a float input. And uh, one of the things about OSL is it will not automatically translate certain socket connections. So like for instance, this output color is three channels, red, green, and blue. If you hook that into a float channel, it'll actually give you an error because it can't, it can't process that information. So instead of doing that, we got this handy little uh, output down here that says output single channel. And what that's going to do is it's actually going to output a single channel that is a, um, a black and white version of the texture. And we can use that. So if we plug that in, I'll just give it a second here, and there we go. We now have our metalness that looks correct. And so that's a big thing to remember with the OSL shading is that you do need to respect data types as they transfer back and forth. There are some exceptions to this, like um, it would be okay for you to hook this single channel into a surface, into a color input, in which case um, the OSL will take that single channel and basically multiply it three times for the red, green, and blue. Um, so things like that do work. So you can basically expand a channel, but you can't compress them. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. We'll just roll with that. So anyway, so now you've got a couple more materials. And if you wanted to render this, you certainly could. Nothing too fancy. You know, just go over here and check your render settings. Hit render. And it's now done. And of course, this doesn't really look good at all. I mean, the lighting is terrible. We haven't done any UV mapping of the textures or anything like that. So, But anyway, just kind of show you how quickly it is to use the OSL system in the new Blender Seed. So that's all well, good, and fine, but uh, as you might have noticed, I purposely actually did this. I loaded uh, JPEG textures into these texture nodes, and that works, but it's not, it's not, the, it's not a great way to use OSL. Uh, OSL actually really likes if you use something called uh, MIP mapping textures, and what MIP mapping is, um, long story short, it basically stores several... Uh, downsized versions of the image and then the renderer will actually pick an image that's at the appropriate size of whatever that object is on screen so it, it actually saves quite a bit of memory and it also makes it a lot easier for the renderer to trace so anyway uh, jpegs are not mip mapped but osl ships with a conversion utility called make tx that actually will do that. It'll take an input image like a JPEG or a PNG or what you know, whatever you want to use, and it'll convert it into a mipmacked text, TX texture. Sorry, I kind of stumbled over my own words there. And we want to do that. <clears throat> so you can call up the command line and you can manually enter every thing that you want, which you know works just fine, but it takes an awful long time. An alternative is this nice little texture converter that we have built in now. And what this will do is when you click refresh, it'll look through all the textures in your scene, in which case it found both of these textures, and it'll actually do conversion for you. So there's a couple things you have to make sure you do first, though. Um, you have to respect what the color space of the image is. And color space is actually important because Every, every renderer that does physically based rendering expects to see linear inputs, which basically means, you know, like two units is twice as bright as one, three is three times as bright as one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, a lot of color textures actually don't follow that. They're uh, what is called gamma mapped. And so that might mean, you know, five is actually only twice as bright as one or something like that. So what you need to do is you need to take those gamma textures and linearize them. And that's kind of what this control does. I mean, what this does right here is you use it to specify what color space your original image is in. So in our case, we've got two texture maps. We've got a color texture map and a black and white metalness texture map. Now the metalness is a single channel, black and white, and it's meant to represent data. You know, zero is a dielectric material, one is a metal. So it's just it's just a data representation, just strict ones and zeros. So that's already going to be in a linear space. So for actually for the metalness texture, this is not correct. We want to take this drop down and you want to change it to linear. 
and basically this tells the converter that it doesn't need to actually do any color space conversion on this texture. It's already in linear space, so it'll just pass that through. But now the color texture, on the other hand, this is red, green, blue, and it's meant to promote a color that is going to be gamma mapped. It's not going to be in linear space. So down here, when you leave color space as sRGB, which is what a color texture is usually going to be, it'll actually convert it to linear during the texture make phase. So that's kind of a kind of a nice little helpful little built-in tool. So it's got these two textures. It found both of them. And all you basically need to do is hit the convert button. And you can sit here and wait for about that long. And it's already done. So it has taken these two JPEG textures and created mipmapped.tx textures. And you can, to actually get those to be used in the render, there's two things you can do. You can go over here and you can actually select the metalness.tx, there it is right there. Or you can just click this little button. And what this button will do is when it comes time to render, it will go out and it will find those texture file names and it will automatically replace them with the TX versions, which is, you know, nice, clean. You don't have to worry about locating your files. You know, say you've got a dozen and a half textures that are all JPEGs. You don't have to go through and substitute all of those. And so it's a nice little, it's a nice little trick and it's a nice little tool. But use with care, of course. The big one is going to always make sure that you get the correct color space of your texture when you load it. And so that's that's OSL shading. Um, the big reason that Appleseed uses it is because it's a third-party library that's maintained and developed by a major effects house, in this case, uh, Sony Pictures Imageworks. And that's a lot more cost-effective than trying to build all of these features into Appleseed as a native implementation. Um, a lot, you know, some people are going to notice and some people are probably going to complain that OSL does render slower than the built-in system, and that's just kind of the nature of the beast. Um, it's a separate system. It's doing a lot more fancy processing, especially of textures, and so there is a bit of a speed penalty. Um, from what I've seen in my own rendering, it's not as significant as the speed penalty for using OSL in cycles. Um, the lead developer actually of Appleseed actually caught a... Uh, a glitch in the way the OSL was texturing stuff about a month or so ago and he fixed that and that uh, sped things up quite a bit so so yes OSL is slower but the trade-off is uh, the trade-off is very much worth it so that's OSL so like I said some of the other things that I wanted to kind of quickly take you through is render passes so these were added and basically these are just these work exactly the same as render passes in cycles so if you want to see the direct diffuse lighting you click that and the pass will be available during rendering let's just kick one off here and you can see down here direct diffuse you probably won't see much because this is mainly a mainly a metal texture so yeah there's there's really nothing there but um, if there was diffuse information you would see it on this pass so that's new. What else is new? Uh, these two controls are actually new. What this is doing is it actually allows you to export uh, project files instead of rendering. In case you wanted to use, you know, Appleseed uh, command line in, its, in and of itself, separately from Blender, what you can do is you can click on export frame, enter your little title, you know, save it wherever you want. You can even create a compressed archive. And then as a later point, you can go in and render that with Appleseed Studio, the command line interface, uh, you know, what have you. Um, animation will export a file for every single scene, which can get a little bit large, but, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Uh, the other big one that we want to go over is actually a denoiser. So much like Cycles, Appleseed now has a denoiser built in as well. And it has three different modes of operation. There's either off, which obviously doesn't do anything, <laughs> on which you know allows these settings to be adjusted and this will actually launch the denoising process after a render takes place so after the render fills in you'll see a bit of a pause and then uh, the denoised image will pop up and the third option is write outputs and what that is basically going to do is it's going to collect all of the data that the denoiser needs but it won't actually run the denoiser what it'll do instead is it'll save a number of output files to whatever directory you decide on using here 
and then at a later point you can actually run the denoiser directly on those files and so you know just kind of giving you a little bit more options on how to work with it but kind of jumping a little bit back to the uh, the OSL system here, um, one of the cool things that I actually didn't really go into a whole lot of detail on is the fact that the OSL nodes are actually being uh, dynamically built at startup time based on a number of files. And here I can actually uh, show you those files. So we go to, uh, where did I put that? Up, oh, yep, there it is. So we go into the Appleseed folder you know, this is your, your download that you actually run the program off of. There's that bin folder I mentioned earlier. And if you go into the shaders and go into either one of these two folders, I guess, you know, there's shaders in both of them. And these are the actual OSL shaders that are being scanned at startup. And then, so it's scanning these, getting the information, and then it's building these nodes dynamically. So the advantage of that is that it actually allows you to put your own OSL shaders into Blender if you want to. Um, just to kind of show you what one of those looks like, I'm just going to kind of pull up um, one of the actual source files that shows one of them. So this is an OSL file. As you can see, uh, a lot of code, um, some fancy stuff, maybe not. But anyway, um, anybody can write these, and you just need a simple text editor to do it. And if you were to write one of these OSL nodes to do whatever you want, and then you compile it with um, a utility that's shipped with Appleseed, and then you put that resulting file into the same folder that is the rest of these shaders live, um, it'll scan it on startup just like everything else, and it'll make that shader available in one of these drop down menus. And so that's actually pretty cool. Um, it's a little, it works a little bit differently than cycle system, but uh, it's a little bit more, I don't know if you want to use the term homogenous, but uh, anyway, it allows you to use your own OSL shaders in the system. And so that's, that's pretty much it as far as uh, the big one. Like I said, OSL is a big one for Appleseed. Uh, they've been targeting it for a couple of years, and so it's actually a really good thing to get it into Blender. And um, the big advantage about that is that all of the applications that can interface with Appleseed are actually accessing the same shader library. So basically it means that a shader that you set up in Blender should be translatable to say like 3ds max or maya or anything like that and it should look pretty much the same um, you know barring any changing in lighting or sampling or anything like that and uh, so that's that's actually a pretty cool thing there's like a common shader library that ships with appleseed that every application will have access to and so that's pretty much it. Like I said, just a, just a quick overview of it, some of the new features. Uh, there's a lot of little things here and there under the hood. Um, there's visibility flags, um, SSS sets, and I guess um, could get into those in a different video, but not, not necessarily here. But like I said, um, you know, we love feedback. We want to hear how this stuff works. Uh, you know, we kind of live in a bubble of uh, designing this stuff. And, you know, we want to hear from regular users, you know, how do you use this stuff? What, uh, what needs to be changed? And all that stuff. And um, so there's a couple ways to get a hold of us. You can get a hold of us on the forums at appleseedhq.net. Um, we have a discourse or a Discord channel, or um, you know, Blender Artist Forum. We hang out there. You know, any of those places. You know, if you have any feedback or any questions or stuff, feel free to ask. And so, uh, thanks for watching.